Hello, my name is Melissa Mickens, and I'm the Artistic Production Associate at Manhattan Theater Club. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Manhattan Theater Club's theaters and offices occupy the unceded land of the Munsee Lenape people. We pay respect to them and to the many indigenous nations of this region. We invite you to learn more about the lands you inhabit at native-land.ca. Hello and welcome. I would like to thank you for tuning in to the Beyond the Stage talk series, Recovery Through the Arts, a series of three conversations examining how the arts can be used as a tool for processing monumental events and healing. For this conversation, photographer and former human rights journalist, Kate Ryan, will be discussing her documentary photography project, Signed X, with Dr. Marilyn Pendleton, founder and CEO of Your Voice Heard, LLC. The women will discuss not only Ms. Ryan's project, Signed X, which includes interviews and photographs of over 50 long-term survivors of sexual violence, but they will also discuss the profound impact of Paula Vogel's Pulitzer Prize winning play, How I Learned to Drive, and how the arts can be a powerful tool for both survivors and their support systems. I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for, for letting me be part of this um, amazing collection of, of art and creativity around this subject. Um, I love this play very much, so I'm very excited to be sort of part of the community. Um, so what you're seeing, um, for those of you who are viewing as we chat, um, is part of a project, a larger project called Signed X, uh, that started in 2017, um, sort of right out the gate of the Me Too movement. Um, I was working as a, a journalist in early, like I saw my last year of graduate school for, of journalism and interning and the Harvey Weinstein story broke. Um, and there was just sort of this immediate jump to action, I think, um, on the part of the media and sort of like anything that happens quickly, um, things are missed and uh, intentions are, were good, I think, uh, for the most part. Um, but I think in an effort to expose wrongdoing um, as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible, um, what I saw sort of being lost as someone who had experienced sexual violence myself um, were the stories of survivors and um, including, you know, high, high profile uh, men and women who had been abused. Um, I think the nuance was lost and we focus, we often focus uh, as a society on, you know, an event as you know, a singular event, a moment in time, which is not most people's experience. Um, and then, you know, a, a court case that follows or, you know, someone coming to some incredible like healing moment and starting a foundation or someone crashing and, and burning in some way, sort of these like, at this point, maybe stereo stereotypical like outcomes of an action and uh, my experience and the experience of so many of the individuals that I've spoken with are that surviving sexual violence it isn't about those moments. It's about these, all the moments in between. It's about how you feel when you wake up on Tuesday, uh, two months after and how you get your kids on the bus to school and how you finish college and go to work and be intimate with a new person and take care of your body or not take care of your body. Sort of just all of these micro decisions that we're making um, or don't have the strength to make. Uh, and yeah, so I, <laughs> that's sort of a long way of saying, um, at the time, I just didn't feel like the reality of what it is to survive sexual violence and, and in the long term was being shown. So I sort of put out a call, you know, to friends, to peers, to connections, and just said, this is what I'm thinking about. Feel free to pass this on. 
I don't want to knock on doors. I want this to be something that people can come to me if they want to be part of this. Um, Mm -hmm. So that it felt like, you know, in their full control Um, and people came knocking. And so basically I would go to folks uh, homes or meet them in a safe space if home is not a safe space um, and have a long conversation about just life after um, life after violence. And uh, we'd often talk about um, the abuse itself, but they didn't have to, if they, you know, if they didn't choose to, we focus on what they wanted to speak about. Um, and these conversations were half an hour to two hours long, depending on, you know, what they wanted to share. And then after the conversation was done, we'd take a break, we'd breathe, we'd talk about how we were feeling. Um, And then I'd say, okay, so I heard you say this, and I heard you say this, you mentioned this was helpful for you. You mentioned this is a, a trigger. This is something that comes a lot. This is something you're struggling with. This is a place where you feel really good. Um, are you comfortable building a photograph around that? So, you know, talking to someone about how yoga was incredibly important for them and say, like, would you be comfortable, like, building some photographs around you doing yoga or someone who, um, you know, was struggling with an eating disorder um, and talking about building a photograph around them in their, in their kitchen space and things that were, you know, some of them that were really hard and people just had free range to say like, absolutely, that doesn't work for me. Um, or they could say like, well, how about this? And, and so it was very much a collaborative effort and, I was intent on making a whole process feel like a, an, an act of consent and collaboration and people decided whether they wanted their name to be associated um, or if they wanted to go by a different name or a first initial, um, if they wanted their faces shown or not. Um, all of those decisions were left up to the folks involved. Um, and then they had time because this project took a lot of time. So they had time to come back and say, actually, I don't think I want to do this. Or can you only use photos that didn't have my face? Or you know what? Use the photos that have my face. Like I've changed my mind. I want. Um, so there was some time to think and process afterwards. And um, yeah, so these are some of just very few of the photos and quotes from the conversation. But um, there is a website where a lot of them live right now, um, many photos and many of the longer conversations. Um, and yeah, the, the project now lives online. Um, it's been published in a number of um, news outlets and it's also a physical exhibit. So it's traveling to universities, mental health conferences, um, it's currently at a university in Maine right now and, and was just at a conference in Seattle on, on trauma and dissociation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's there for anyone who, who would find it to be helpful. Yeah. I yeah. hope that wasn't too long winded. Oh, no, that, that was, um, amazing. Thank you so much. And, um, um, I'll continue the conversation with you later on. I want you to finish um, to do your slides and continue your photographs because um, and uh, allow people the opportunity to um, read the text of individuals' stories. Yeah, so for, for those who are um, who have opted in to view, um, I hope that you'll feel comfortable muting us and <laughs> coming back and looking through. Um, this is all also available okay. on the website. Um, but I just, you know, I thought about sort of how this this is a first time having a virtual conversation while um, things are being shown. And mm-hmm. I think just looking at photographs might be a little bit more digestible in this context, but mm-hmm. um, I feel very strongly for this project about keeping people's words with their photos because that was what the that was what they signed on for. Um, so I I understand that for those who are looking and listening to us, the text might be hard to read, but I hope that you'll go back um, and look at it or just go directly to the website. 
um, but these will be rolling for a while. So, so oh, okay. So I can, <laughs> well, I will, I can relate to you as far as presentations are concerned <laughs> because you draw, I know personally me, I draw energy for, from the individuals with whom I engage and it allows you a better sense of their emotions and you can really hear their hearts um, in the circumstance um, when when they're actually talking about their experience. Tell me about your journey um, with your exhibits in other countries. Um, in other countries. Uh, so this work hasn't traveled outside of the okay. country yet. It, virtually it has. It's been, uh, um, I was connected with journalists in France and Portugal who both, mm -hmm. you know, published on the project. So that, and I have had international um, responses. So, the, so there is a, um, an email account on the website that you can reach out to if you're interested in um, sharing the exhibit or in, in connecting to share to share your own story, um, mm -hmm. and so I actually have had people from as far as Australia reach out and share their stories and experiences, and oh how I wish I could hop on a flight and um, you know go do these interviews in person, and because um, it it is it has felt important to me to be in the space with people. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very, you know, no matter how far out you are, um, it's a lot to have a stranger ask you intimate questions about your experience and to feel like you have some control over how the conversation is going. Um, and, you know, I do think maybe Zoom has changed how we can do that from afar, but for a long time, it felt very important to me to be in the space with people and to be in a space that that was theirs and that they had control of and that they felt safe in. Um, so I haven't I haven't been able to go, and I also don't have the funding <laughs> to go and hop on a plane to um, you know somewhere in in Europe or Asia or um, wherever. But I have had people from those from countries across the world reach out um, and just share their stories virtually. And we've been able to sort of just have a conversation. And for some people, that's what they're looking for. You know, for there are a number of people who have reached out um, digitally or who were part of this project who had never shared their story before. And I think a chance to lay it all out and like be your own narrator and to not have, you know, any interruptions while you're sharing is, it's not all people are looking for, but it's a big part of what a lot of folks are looking for, um, to be able to say it all and not have there be a correct way to talk about things and to use the language that you want to use and to feel confused and complicated about it. Um, having a space for that, mm -hmm. I think is, I think is meaningful and um, yeah, a cathartic for some people. And sexual assault is a public health issue. And uh, from the literature uh, from the World Health Organization, it, it's mentioned the director uh, identifies it as endemic in every country. Mm -hmm. That being said, I would say it's more of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. People are vulnerable and with the occurrence of COVID, it increased vulnerabilities and it also increased the incidence. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you are bringing this to light in the arts and the way that you can bring it to light in the arts. People receive information differently. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see how I learned to drive. First, I read the script and then I went to 
see it. And it resonated with so many stories I've heard in the past as a grief recovery method specialist. And it resident, resonated to my own experience as a survivor of sexual assault. And um, it's important because a lot of things that occur in individual life, individuals' lives are swept under the rug. Not only are they swept under the rug, basically they are considered, considered uh, culturally acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that silences people, um, whether it's male or female, or if they're, if they may be transgender, you know, everyone, every social economic status, every faith, um, every ethnicity are subject to um, sexual assault. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly pervasive and it's one of those things sort of, I mean, I, I can't think of too many equivalents. I mean, I guess in the, the United States, I think like death is similar, but, but it's like something that touches all of us. We all know someone mm -hmm. or it's happened to us. And yet we struggle so much to talk about it, or we refuse to talk about it, or or people in power keep us from talking about right. it, um, whether it's happening within a religious community or a family or um, just a local community. But yeah, it is it is everywhere, and we don't want to talk about it. And if we do, um, I do think there are like recent work has come out in film and television and books and sort of like we are adding to the nuance around this conversation um but for a long time I think stories were very simplified and mm -hmm. trauma was pathologized and there was this expectation that you at some point should move on or fix it or heal or goes the other way or this person is broken this person you know and I just don't I've interviewed dozens and dozens of individuals who have gone through this experience and nobody is like fixed or healed or broken or you know like we're all just <laughs> sort of on this like wave and every day is different like similar to grief um you know when you go through a loss like it is not a straight trajectory you are going to have these ups and downs and ins and outs and moments of confusion I mean speaking of how I learned to drive like for individuals who I've worked with who have been abused by family members or mm -hmm. religious mm -hmm. leaders or teachers, people who they have a lot of trust in and who yeah. might have had some positive contributions to their lives. Like that's a lot to parse out for yeah. an individual, particularly a child. Um, and we are very uncomfortable as, as a country, certainly, but I think globally at the, the notion that a person could have mixed feelings about um about you know the individual who abused them it's it's so much more complicated than than we have let the narrative be in the past which is why i think work like this work like how i learned to drive is important yes and, and grief is complex mm -hmm. and uh, those and there are those positive and negative experiences that you have in relationship with an individual. It is so important and I'm glad you mentioned grief because it is a response to the CDC. Um, it says it's a response to death. It's a response to traumatic events, for example, adverse childhood experiences. But 
it's only a piece, um, a trauma is a piece of the puzzle because grief is a response to any sort of drastic change in your life. Mm -hmm. And experiencing sexual assault, there is change. It's the physiological change that occurs with the individual. Uh, there is the intellectual shift, for example, students in school or even adults who are in school or working adults working in the workplace. There is a disruption in their ability to concentrate. So you'll see changes in grades, changes in work performance. People don't show up to work. Uh, it impacts their emotional state, as you talked about the waves um, in the journey. It's not linear and uh, it impacts their social um, dynamic. It impacts how they, as you said, trust, um, lack of approval, whether or not they are really engaged in society and, and moving forward. But we as a society teaches us how to um, acquire things, but they don't, society doesn't teach us how to lose things. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate life yeah. when we lose um, our, our being due to uh, a violent assault mm -hmm. or lose yeah. our being due to something that's insidious like grooming as was is described and help um how I learned to drive yeah and this um again I do think we're we're getting better but even with certain um I feel like the term resiliency is thrown out a lot particularly when we were talking about kids, kids are so resilient, even around like COVID, like kids are so resilient, kids bounce back and human beings are resilient. And like, that's beautiful. Um, but resiliency isn't something that we just like have. Resiliency is built over time. And so much of that is, um, is not an individual sort of building in ourselves. It depends on the community that we are in and the resources that we have and the economic security that we have and the home that we are in and the air that we are breathing. Like resilience, you build, we are constantly trying to add to our like toolbox of, of resiliency um, when we fill ourselves with whatever fills our cup. And um, so that's, that's another thing that comes up again and again in, in this work. And I think in this play, um, we expect survivors of sexual violence, of any sort of grief or loss to follow the same timeline and the same path. And like, well, it's been two years, aren't you like better? Or like, it's five years, why is this coming up now? And the difference for people who had partners who were supportive or family members who they could talk to or the economic security to go to the doctors and get tested or have an abortion or whatever they needed to do. Um, you know, you can't even begin to start that, you know, self work that is required after surviving sexual violence. If you don't have community in place, if you don't have resources in place, um, and the feeling that you are believed and supported by, by others, that is so essential. And it is deeply unfair that we sort of place a burden on anyone to follow any sort of trajectory, but certainly that we expect people to move at the same pace in the same timeline. And, um, and it goes both ways with, with survivorship too, in terms of, you know, I've talked to so many people who didn't process what they'd experienced until much later. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's because 
something challenging happened later in their lives down the road that triggered something for them that sort of opened the Pandora's box a bit. Yeah. And there are other folks who it was only when they finally felt safe that they were able to start processing because they were in an abusive home or they were in a situation where they just sort of had to like keep plowing through and like get up and go to work the next day. And it was only when they were able to take a break and rest that everything sort of flooded out. So it's just, it's so different for everyone. And that's sort of what, you know, the essential nature of this project of SignedX is that you, there is no script for this. Everyone is going through this in a very different way. And so the best thing the rest of us can do as we're trying to support is just to listen and to not place any expectations on a person for how they should respond to something um, positively or negatively. Absolutely. And as you said, just listen. Uh, it's remarkable because I became a grief recovery method specialist. I was I worked in schools for many years and working with elementary school students and in high school students hearing their voice and, and that's why I named my company Your Voice Heard mm -hmm. because I feel that everyone needs to have their heart heard. Um, they need not be marginalized and, um, and they need to be validated. Whether or not individuals don't want to hear it, but I worked as a school nurse and I felt that my position was very much a position of advocacy, mm -hmm. education and advocacy, and particularly for uh, the weest, the weest ones, mm -hmm. because they they don't feel they don't feel safe. Where do they turn to? Who who do they turn? Who do they tell? Yeah moving forward and knowing those same students when I transitioned to uh, a high school to work and I knew their stories yeah. and uh, helping them navigate life um, and mentoring them along the way, connecting their emotions with their behaviors and definitely referring them out for support that they did not receive earlier and they don't every we live in a country actually that does have resources and supports but it varies mm -hmm. if you go to more rural areas mm -hmm. you can forget it oftentimes there's it's nothing there for emotional not, not much for emotional or mental health support and when you're looking at it as a public health issue uh, we need to bring more awareness and uh, I thank you for your work I am so grateful for Manhattan Theater Club to have me on this on this project because it is um, a, a community approach to deal with this but the production also revealed the isolation that the protagonist had, how isolated she was, how unprotected she was. And that happens day to day, whether we're in an urban setting, suburban or, or rural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hear you on, on kids in particular, um, which I think this show highlights so well. Um, I am currently, uh, I, I had been living in New York um, for a number of years. I currently live in Maine. And, and in this last year, I've been working with um, a sexual assault response center in more of a like counseling capacity um, mm -hmm. and a family advocacy capacity, um, mostly with youth. Um, and it is a lot of rural families and it is a lot of abuse within families because your community is smaller that's who you live around so like the likelihood that you're going you know 
sort of, sort of the math tracks for who you're around and who you are more likely to be victimized by. Um, and yeah, you're correct. The, the resources simply aren't there. And these are kids and some of them like coming into their teen years that already this pressure is placed on them by their schools and their communities of like, well, why aren't you telling anyone? Why didn't, you know, why didn't you push back all of these things? And these are children. These are, these are small humans who will do anything they can to keep safe and to protect the people around them. That is the natural inclination of kids. You see it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, and yet the resources just, they are not there. I mean, I have spent so many hours on the phone trying to get, and particularly now coming out of COVID, the mental health resources are not there. Um, access to affordable health care for kids who need it following abuse is not there right now. Yeah, it's we're in a we're in a moment where we're talking about this, but we need policy change and we need more organizations that are doing this work. Um, I'm going to, I think this has, this has stopped. So let me okay. pull up. There's another, I can just have slides going in the background so that we're not uh, looking at the same screen over and over again. Sorry. Give me one second. These are just some other photos that weren't shared. So oh, okay. You can just have it going in, <laughs> going in the background. <laughs> uh, there are a lot. So there have been um, about around fifty um, folks who I've interviewed for this project so far, and so um, what was playing in sort of the first slide um, are the are the ones who that have been printed and are travel in a physical exhibit, and then these are just some, some other ones that. Um, when the grant money comes rolling in, I'll print them, I'll print them too. Um, well, I have a question and where, um, where were your participants interviewed? Were they primarily in New York or were they in other regions? Primarily the New England area. So, um, I was living, I was living in New York city, um, you know, from like 2016 up through the middle of the pandemic. And um, so I would say um, probably 75% were New Yorkers, but from all over and, you know, many of them not lifelong New Yorkers. So um, many of them, you know, their experiences of abuse had happened um, in other places. And then uh, my family is from Rhode Island originally. So I did some of my interviews there and then Massachusetts, Connecticut, sort of that area. Um, and have had, again, many conversations with folks all over the country, but was just sort of at, you know, I was a, a student and a freelance journalist. So hopping on a plane uh, wasn't really an option. Um, but yeah, so there, these are mostly New Yorkers and New Englanders. And what, for the resources that were available, because we know COVID has created such a absence, uh, such a void of emotional mental health resources available and the weight requires yeah three to six months easily for a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, uh, just, can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, my, again, but sort of pre-COVID with a lot of these conversations, so most of these conversations happened between 2017 and 2020. Okay. Uh, and for the sort of pre-pandemic perspective, um, there were a number of people who were in therapy or were part of a support group, um, but there were many that were not. And there were many that had sort of found their own, um, their own therapy. And like, that's the other thing too about um, sexual violence. I know um, 
I, I personally did not share my experience for a number of years. I sort of, um, yeah, it was at a sort of a moment of transition in life. My family was going through a lot. My father was quite sick. Um, there was just a lot. And I think I was young enough that I was like, nobody can handle this right now. Like just sort of put it aside. And when I did finally start to feel like, okay, I have to address this. I tried talk therapy and it was like, and no, 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 <laughs> like not ready. Um, and so I got very engaged sort of physically and sort of in yoga and rock climbing and things that felt like I was using my whole body. I was building strength. I was like sort of parallel doing things with others, but, um, it allowed me to sort of recenter and get back into my body and get in touch with my body. And after that, I felt ready to sort of have conversations. And so I, I find things like that for a lot of people. Um, yoga is very common. I mean, it's, it's definitely like throughout the literature to like, it is yoga and meditation and ways to sort of get in touch with your body and your breathing are hugely important for a lot of survivors. So being very physical, but like sort of being physical in other ways, interviewed one person who, um, got into burlesque and like sort of owning her body and her sexuality in this way that felt fun and, um, and powerful was the most healing thing for her and um for other people like they found organic ways to we all have friends who have been abused so like connecting to people in their lives who they knew who had and like creating sort of an informal network um people other people have picked up art projects and you know painting and drawing and music and and things to process so I don't think um, even pre-pandemic, everyone was beelining for therapy. What I think we're seeing in the pandemic is the need feels more urgent for so many people because when you are in isolation, you are left with your thoughts and you are left with your dreams and you are left with yourself and there's nothing else to look at. And so, um, I think a lot of people I've worked this year with many older adults, people in their sixties and seventies who are seeking out therapy around sexual violence for the first time in their lives, because they, there's no distractions. They're stuck at home and all they have is this. And, um, they can't fill their days with work and hobbies and errands. And so to be stuck with the thing you've been avoiding for years and years makes it feel like, oh my God, if I don't talk to somebody now, I'm in trouble. Like this is going to get bad. And so that's where I, I think we've seen people will always require different things following sexual violence. But I do think we see a more common thread of people feeling like I need urgent mental health assistance. I don't even know what I need. I need someone to help me figure out what I need. Um, and I think isolation has really propelled that um, forward. And with that has come an absolute shortage of mental health professionals and poor funding uh, from the government for mental health professionals and for hospitals to have mental health professionals and for hospitals to have forensic nurses mm -hmm. um, for when folks come in in an emergency situation. Um, and then those who might have someone available in their areas can't afford it because health insurance doesn't cover, you know, that person's care. It is so beyond the individual right now. Like I, I recognize that our government leaders have a lot on their plate uh, when it comes to the pandemic, but we are in an absolute mental health crisis and, and the money just simply isn't being put towards those resources. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I, I do agree with that. Um, a couple of things, well, two, when you speak of the isolation and because they're so used to keeping busy because that is one, um, some misinformation that 
has been provided to us generation through generation. And we can't, Maya Angelou says, we, um, when you know better, do better. And when you're, if you're constantly busy, it physically exhausts you. And so when you go eventually put your head down or you're still, that response, those feelings related to the sexual assault are still there. And generationally have been told what goes on in the house stays in the house. You don't talk about family. You keep your mouth shut, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And when adults, when young people become adults, as you say, they're more in their senior years, mm -hmm. stuck in the home, and they're struggling with that. And that is a huge leap for particularly for seniors. And they, a lot of times they aren't tech savvy. Yeah. So there's the other struggle. So there's greater isolation and an increased pro proclivity to um, engage in alcohol mm -hmm. abuse due to that isolation. I think that, you know, with my understanding and my research, and I truly believe that what needs to be addressed is transdisciplinary approaches, because this is a complex societal issue. And it, it takes more than strictly the mental health area. Mm -hmm. um, and the physical area and forensics. It also requires, as you mentioned, policy change. And it needs, it needs to be holistic, basically. And policy change is significant. One of the reasons why I left my full-time job in education I had a great salary, all this other stuff. I was in central office, mm -hmm. but I was tired of what I was encountering with in the school community because everybody needed so much support. I, I would engage with staff members and leaders and families and community stakeholders. I needed to get answers through research mm -hmm. to validate what I saw was occurring in my clinical life and practice. I did get those answers. Now I'm in a position to um, leverage data with compassion mm -hmm. because everything is about um, numbers at the end of the day. We are human beings and there is, I always say, and I, I do have this in my dissertation, there is a story behind every metric. Mm. And whatever someone is experiencing, um, whatever you see a number, there is a story behind it. And with those stories and with you telling stories, the numbers of stories, that data needs to be supported and funded in a transdisciplinary approach to make the shift. And this way in the arts, it's just, just one way that this we can tackle this as a society. I mean, this is so valuable. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, it's hard. It's hard to wrap our heads around complicated things. Like, I think that's, you know, a very basic notion, but there's also, it feels like a refusal sometimes to say that one thing is many, you know, that there are many factors here and therefore we need like a multifactored uh, response to it. We want to say like, this is a physical thing. So let's treat it as a physical thing. This is a mental health thing. So let's treat it as a mental health thing. And, um, and any other number of responses and, 
and that simply isn't isn't the case and if we keep treating it sort of like one thing at a time we're playing whack-a-mole like we're just you know we're trying to like meet each crisis as it comes up um and it's in the air it's in the water like we're we're drinking it um so we need sort of anybody who has a stake in this which should be everybody um to to participate in both the response to you know survivors who who need it and the exposure of abuses of power you know where where they stand um and to open our minds to you know i think one thing that this um one of many things that this play does well is um looks at this man uh in a complicated light and shows other people's you know sort of view of him um and this notion of well like not not the man i know like the man i know would never do that Mm -hmm. and it's really hard for us as a as a society to say yeah maybe the man that you know wouldn't do that but the man i know Mm -hmm. and he did it to me like so when are we gonna you know when are we gonna start acknowledging and wrapping our heads around the fact that people are complicated and and power power dynamics exist in every aspect of our lives it's not Mm -hmm. just you know Hollywood producers it's parents and their children it's partners it's you know pillars in the community yeah yeah Yeah. who who might have done some good yeah and Mm -hmm. and might have done you know some real damage um it's hard it's a hard pill to swallow but if we don't start sort of accepting that as a concept um we will continue to be you know complicit as communities and families and um in watching these you know these people in power do real harm Yes, yeah. Now, I do have a question for you. How would, uh, for example, universities, their students are coming back, they have been coming back to campus, there is incidents, increased incidents of emotional and mental health challenges with um, adolescents and adolescents that the age has extended to the age of 24. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them don't want to hear that, but mm, <laughs> adolescence ends at age 24. It's documented in research because of brain development. <laughs> um, college campuses, you mentioned that you were at the University of, did you say Minnesota? Um, it's currently um, at the University of New England in Maine. New England. Okay. Um, but and how does that happen? How do they connect with you? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm an adjunct. So, uh, you know, I want to know this is, <laughs> is important. So anyone I share it to that, you know, that people need to know how to connect with you, mm-hmm. um, best ways, what's the timeline, how long does it take to, um, and how long are you uh, available for mm-hmm. your shows? Yeah, sure. So, um, Truly, I can only answer this because it's, it feels like it's happened to me rather than anything that I sought out. But this project initially existed strictly online. And then I um, there was a group of um, social workers and public health workers um, that were sort of like part of a, a university collective. Like they worked with students across campuses. Mm-hmm. Um, that had reached out and said, we want to bring this um, to schools. Like, what do we need to do? And I was like, well, fund it. <laughs> um, and so they, they, we all we applied for a grant um, uh, to sort of treat it as a public health project. And we're able to get those initial like prints um, uh, printed and framed. And um, so that was sort of the initial, it was truly like someone reached out um, to me. And now it's it's been like very much word of mouth that way, like one professional sent to another, um, either the, the website or the article. But for folks who want to um, 
want to reach out in the future, um, they can always email me directly. My email is um, kateryanphotos at gmail.com. Um, and there's also the project email, which is on um, the website. So the website is signedexproject.com. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and folks are able to go on that and reach out to me through that. And so it's, you know, it's truly been, um, just sort of by email request and the project has visited places virtually and the physical exhibit as well. Um, so open, we're definitely open to that. Um, and it right now it's going to be in, in its current, um, university space for, for, about a month or two, um, but I've also brought it to conferences for 48 hours. So it, it can, you know, it can kind of be be what folks need it to be. Um, and I wish I had a, a clear sense of timeline and all of that, but it's sort of just dependent on and where and when it's needed or, or wanted by folks. Um, but something like this is really cool too, because it's just a chance to sort of give people a, a taste for the work. And then my hope with a conversation like this is always that people will then go to the website, visit the New York Times article, whatever feels most accessible to them, um, and take a minute with these stories on their own. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little bit nervous coming into this conversation today um, because I haven't... Um, sort of talked about it at length in a while. Um, what I've, what has become the norm in the last few years is that I either bring the physical project to a space or I share the virtual project with folks and I hope that it speaks for itself because I think there are so many voices in it that do, like they speak for themselves. Like I, if I've done my work, um, then I'm not necessarily needed, um, but I'm always happy to answer to questions and talk about it. But um, yeah, I do. My hope is always that people will take time then to like go to the website um, and sit with one or two stories or all story. You know, people have different rates of like how much they can digest. Um, mm -hmm. Some people will reach out and say. I've looked at every story over the course of the last week, you know, like I couldn't stop. I needed to meet all these people. I needed to hear their stories. And I have people who have said, like, I looked at one and it's great. And then like, I got to back off. Like, this is a lot, um, which I'm sure is sort of the response to a play, like how I learned to drive. Like there are, have to be people who sit through that and say like, keep it going. Like, let's keep, I want to find out what happens next. I want to like, keep staying with this character, um, who I've come to care so much about and, and other people who are like, I got to go home and go to bed after this, because it's, it just is going to land for people differently. Um, but again, the most essential part of this project is the, the individual voices. And so I hope if folks feel up to it, they will, um, they'll go to the site and just you know, sit with a few of the stories and, and get to know these people because they're, they're incredible. Yes, yes, thank you. I didn't get to read them all, but I will. I did get to read some of them and it's, it's just an amazing work. And I truly believe that your calendar will very much be <laughs> very populated <laughs> by the end of the year <laughs> i feel it i feel it <laughs> where we can manifest <laughs> <laughs> so um kudos to you and, and the fabulous work that you've done um once again thank you to um manhattan theater club for recognizing that healing is possible through the art and how you learn to drive and your story and your journey. Thank you so much for, for having this conversation. I really appreciate it.